Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of us this morning. It's 9 a.m., but our bodies feel like it's 8, so <laughs> I'm excited for us to um, encourage each other today as we worship and sing together. So why don't we all stand? Um, and this morning, our, the first song we're going to sing is actually a new song, and so Sabo is going to lead it uh, for us, but it's a song called House of the Lord. Some of us may know it, some of us may not. It's an easy song to sing and to learn, but essentially the, the, the chorus, the, the big line in the song is, there's joy in the house of the Lord. And so I want to encourage us today that um, when we gather and when we worship together, um, we can encourage each other and it can spark joy and uh, in the presence of each other, in the presence of God, all together. So... Let's do that, let's sing. Come on. 
let's continue to sing together and sing about who we are in God, how we are children of the Most High. We sing together, who am I? Who am I not the highest king? Who the sun sets free? Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace. great to be able to celebrate that we are children of the Most High God today. Isn't that wonderful? Want to welcome you here today. This is so great to be with you. Want to welcome, of course, those of you who are in the room and those who are joining online. My name is Phil, and it's my job today to address BC's worst, best-kept secret this weekend, which is that there's a change. We've got a next normal. The next normal is that we have now no size restrictions on indoor gatherings and masks are optional. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for us as a church? It means that masks are optional. That's what it means. And so if you prefer not to wear a mask, that's perfectly good. And if you prefer to wear a mask, that's perfectly good. Uh, you are going to see, at, as far as church programs go, we're going to start to now have some things come more on uh, in person in the next couple of weeks, especially after spring break. And so you can connect with your ministry leaders about that if you're interested about certain times for that. Um, and so all of our programs will be mask optional, and that includes Kid Shine today and, and, uh, and our, our carrying on as we go through our ministries. If I could just offer a pastoral word before we continue on in the rest of the service, it's quite possible that the person next to you or a couple seats over from you might feel a little differently than you do about 
the mask optional situation. And so could I just appeal to you uh, for us as a church to continue to pay attention to what we've been learning through Philippians, that we look not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others, that we find ways to celebrate unity in Christ together, that this place, people would come here and know that this is a culture of honor, a culture of respect. And so even if we feel a little the little niggling to tease one another one way or the other about that, maybe we we refrain from that. And and instead, we celebrate what's going on in one another's lives, that we get to be together in total freedom today to uh, celebrate Christ. So God bless you, church. We're just so grateful to be able to move through these phases together and to continue to learn and be shaped and transformed by the Lord. At this time, we're going to invite kids aged up to grade 7, so that includes J57. Uh, you have specific programming for you. been great having you with us, but you can be dismissed. And the rest of us who are staying in this room, we're going to be led in a Lent reading by Danelle. Thanks. God bless you. Would you follow along with me and, and pray? pray with me? God of mercy, you are full of tenderness in compassion, slow to anger, rich in mercy, and always ready to forgive. So grant us grace to renounce all evil and to cling to Christ, that in every way we may live into the truth that we are your loving children, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue to sing, church. We sing, we're creation. We're creation, suddenly articulate with a thousand Tongues to lift one proud And from north to south And east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified And were the whole earth Echoing His imminence His name
church. Uh, my name is Nick, and I'd like to invite us into a posture of prayer this morning. Uh, before we enter into that moment of prayer, I'd like to read for us uh, a hymn written by a man named Colbane to Mason, uh, an Icelandic chieftain uh, that on his deathbed in the year 1208 felt a sense of divine inspiration. Let us allow these words to guide our minds, our bodies, and our souls into that posture of prayer now. The title of this piece is Heir Hymna Smidur, or Hear Smith of Heavens. Hear Smith of Heavens, the poet seeketh. In thy still small voice mayest thou show grace. I call on thee, for thou art my creator. I am thy servant, thou art my true Lord. God, I call on thee, for thee to heal me. Remember me, Prince of Peace. Thou art my supreme need. Ever I need thee, generous and great over all human woe, city of thy heart. Guard me, my Savior. Ever I need thee, through every moment in this world so wide. Virgin born, send me noble motives now. Aid cometh from thee to my deepest heart. Let's pray. Father, we seek you. You are the creator of good things. We're blessed to say that the creator God of this universe chose us to bear his likeness. It is by this you have gifted us with creativity, bodies, souls, and minds to step out and make beautiful things like our Father has before us. Jesus, we pray that you would form us into a people of like-mindedness. We read and hear words like those of Colbain to Mason from ages long ago and see them as simple yet beautiful. God, would you remain, remind us that the same spirit that inspired this prayer in someone we might have never identified with is the same spirit that binds us all here today. I pray, God, that we would have a new vision of the people around us. Instead of magnifying the ways we differ from one another, would we magnify you, God, and see one another for our new namesake, you, Christ. We are children of grace. Let us not forget this, God. God, we think uh, w from this stance of like-mindedness, and we want to lift up um, our globe to you. Um, our globe uh, and those that are dealing with uh, war and its afflictions. God, we lift them up to you in hopes that you might answer in their time of hopelessness or worry or fear. God, you are a God of love and joy and unity. We pray that you would bring those uh, across our globe. Amen. You may now turn your attention to the screen for In the Know. 
Hello everyone, welcome to Peace Portal. My name is Corey and here's what you need to know. Registration is now open for this summer's Kids Camp, Monumental, happening July 4th to 8th. Kids heading into grades one to five are invited from 9 a.m. to noon as we celebrate God's greatness. Invite cards are available upstairs in the Kidshine area to invite friends and neighbors to join. We can't wait to welcome you to Kids Camp once again this summer. Every third Sunday of the month, a group meets at the church office from 10 to 11 a.m. to pray for our global workers serving in the Middle East. Our next prayer session is on March 20th, and we want to invite you to join us as we pray. Email Pastor John for more info. Parents at Peace Portal, we invite you to join us for a Parent Connect info session on Sunday, March 27th, where we'll be discussing communion. For many believers, celebrating communion together is a special and meaningful time to connect with God and thank Him for the sacrifice that His Son has made. Parents might wonder about when to include our children in this practice and how to go about explaining it to them. Join us for this info session where we will equip you to guide your kids into this awesome celebration. Register online to attend. Giving, an act of worship for us as a church community, gives us opportunities to serve our communities both locally and globally. Will you partner with us in these ministries to serve our neighbors? Give online through our website and at the Connect Center in the church foyer, both upstairs and downstairs. Donation envelopes can be found in the seat backs, which you can place in the giving boxes located inside the doorways of the sanctuary. Click the Give button above the chat if you're joining us online. Thank you for your generous giving. That's all that you need to know. Have a great week. I have never been in a fist fight. Now, this might come as a surprise to absolutely nobody that I would ever do that because, not because I wouldn't necessarily be dominant at it, I would be terrible at it. I have never been in a fist fight in my whole life. I've wrestled with my brother, but I've never even come close to punching somebody. Because I know if I got into a fist fight, there would be, as the old saying goes, three hits. Them hitting me, me hitting the ground, and the ambulance hitting 80 on the way to the hospital as it delivers me to get treatment. I, I'm just not, I don't feel like I lack the coordination. I don't feel strong enough, but I've, I don't think I've ever been passionate enough about something or mad enough about something that I would think I am going to come to blows with this person. But as we, today we look at the idea of anger and we look at the idea of conflict, I, I think today we need to talk about what sometimes feels a little bit over the last season, the elephant in the room. As we talk about how can't we just get along? And I'm talking about us as a church body. I'm talking about it as a people. We have come out of a long season of conflict. And so today, as we open up God's word and we look at the words from Philippians that Paul is writing to the church, I would love for us to consider our part in this and how God not only wants to pave us a path forward, he wants to show us the way that we can find our way out of it, that we might find harmony, we might find community. And today's gonna to be a little bit different. I'm gonna talk for part of it, then we're gonna interview someone in the second half as we look at some practical ways that we can be reconcilers, we can be bringers of harmony and of peace. But regardless of who you are, conflict has been a part of our lives for the last two years. We've been inundated with conflict. Um, and as viewers, we're maybe viewers of the conflict or we're participants in it. But it seems very appropriate today on the Sunday where we have our first day where masks are optional, that we talk about some of the tensions that we live in and how as Christians we might ought, we might ought to deal with them and navigate them. Paul is seeking, uh, speaking into a conflict in Philippians 4 chapter 2 in the church. And it's a conflict that's been ongoing and he wants to speak to it to help them not only resolve it, but give them the, the reason and the, I guess, uh, the underlying, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for words on this, uh, which is rare for me if you know me, uh, why it is imperative that they resolve this conflict. Okay, and so I'm gonna to read to you from the book of Philippians chapter two, uh, four, verse two, and uh, we'll kind of dive into it. We're gonna talk a bit about this text and then we're gonna go into some really practical, how do we as followers of Jesus, how do we as the church engage in navigating conflict together? Here's what it says. Now I appeal to you, Yodia and Syntyche, please 
Because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers who na whose names are written in the book of life. Please, because you belong to the Lord, settle this disagreement. So here we have Paul writing a letter to the church, right? The book of Philippians is a, a letter written to the church. And in it, obviously, this conflict is of the importance that Paul includes in his letter to the church that this incident that is going on needs to be resolved. We need to figure this out. So who are they? Who are these two people? Well, these are two women who are leaders in the church, likely like deacons or like kind of elder type role. They're advisors in the church. They're leaders in the church that have an ongoing dispute. And Paul, who has left, is now hearing about this and he's concerned. He's saying, this needs to be dealt with. We got to figure this thing out because you guys are doing work of the kingdom. You're working shoulder to shoulder in the church. We can't have you in conflict. It's not good for the mission that we're on. It's not good for you. It's not good for the church. And yet he thinks so much of it, it's obviously a big enough issue that he has to bring it up and write it in the letter. And obviously these two people, these women's position in this church is at a level in the church structure that is big enough that Paul makes a point to mention it in his letter to the church in Philippi. But it's also safe to say that this tension must have been going for some time. Right? This wasn't just like a, hey, we had a dispute in the lobby. I don't know if they had a lobby, but uh, if they had a dispute in the lobby or they disagreed about something, this could have been any number of things. And, and different scholars speculate on what it could have been. It could have been interpersonal, but it more likely could have been theological or doctrinal. But it also could have been like a, a dispute where these two might be in like a legal proceeding together. One might be suing the other. And yet they're still like kind of doing the work, the kingdom work. They're still shoulder to shoulder. They're still side by side. But it's very likely that these are influential leaders in the church. And there's speculation, once again, about what it could have been about. But verse 2 here contains a very important framework that we're going to come back to about why Paul and how Paul is encouraging them to look at this. You know, Friday was two years ago since everything really changed for us, right? And I don't know if you guys remember, uh, two years, it would be two years ago today, you know that we practiced for... 40 plus years of this church, a fire drill for the kids, right? If you ever have kids in kids ministry, we do a fire drill and we evacuate, the, we do it twice a year. We take the kids, we do a practice fire drill, we send them out into the parking lot. The first Sunday we didn't meet together, there was a fire in the church in the morning. The wall behind here caught on fire when a plug outside started to burn in the wall. Scott and uh, Derek were here and smoke filled this room. The first Sunday we weren't together ever, the building caught on fire. But two years ago, our whole world changed. Everything changed. But in, since then, I've watched friends and family argue. I've watched church members argue. I have found myself in conversations that got heated about certain issues. And I don't think there's a person in this room that has been immune to this that is going on. The idea that you're around conflict, you're near conflict, someone you know is in conflict. And it could be within your own family. It could be with your spouse. It could be with your kids. It could be with your extended family. And over the last two years, things that we never talked about all of a sudden were all that we talked about. And things we never thought we'd talk about all of a sudden we're talking about. And in that, there's been conflict, there's been tension, and there's been things that have gone unresolved. The problem is, how we've done it has maybe been even more destructive. That in the past, our conversations might be face to face. We would have a conversation and we're going to talk about this with Susie, that we might see one another and talk to one another and we'd have this chat. But the problem is a lot of the dialogue that happened, happened online, it happened on phones, it happened on social media, it happened on Facebook, it happened via text. It happened when we weren't close together. And the problem with that is that's not actually how great communication works. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. According to a CBC poll, 75% of people think that the last two years has brought out the worst in people. And to a person, nearly all of us has been a part of or participated in an intense conversation about the pandemic. And I would suspect, as I know in my own life, some of those conversations and some of those tensions are unresolved. That some of the conversations that you had remain as unsolved, remain divided. And maybe there's people in your life that you no longer speak to. Lifelong friends, family members, neighbors, whatever it happens to be. The problem is when we don't deal with conflict and Jesus makes it really clear that we should, when we don't deal with conflict, it doesn't go away. 
It's not water under a bridge. You don't sweep it under the rug. Sweeping it under the rug doesn't make it go away. The thing is, we start loading it up. And then all of a sudden, we're carrying a lot of it with us. And then we get back together in this room or you get somewhere with people. And all of a sudden, there's people who are like, hey, I'm, I'm kind of avoiding that person. I'm avoiding a conversation with so-and-so. Or I feel weird now. Our relationship is different now. And what happens is you don't realize it is that you start to load up a suitcase that you drag around with you of conflict, of problems, of arguments, of debates that you've had, issues that you've had with people, and you lug that around with you. And there's no freedom in this. There's no freedom in having to carry this around with you. There's no freedom in unresolved conflict, which is why the Bible challenges us regularly to consider how we might resolve it. And Paul, his encouragement to these two women in the church is, you need to figure this out because this isn't good for you. It isn't good for you to drag this around. It isn't good for you to have unresolved conflict. It isn't good for you to live in tension. I don't know about you. I don't want to live in disharmony. I don't want to walk on eggshells around certain people. I don't want to avoid people. I don't want to, I don't want to put a, go to a grocery store and then put on a mask because I see someone that I don't want to recognize me, okay? That's not, shouldn't be my motivation for doing that. But the truth be told is there, for some of you, there might be people in your life that you are avoiding because you have had intense conversations that have gone unresolved. So it's no surprise in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Those that would make peace, that would bring harmony, those that would pursue those things. The why in Romans 16, it would encourage us to live in harmony. And I'm so thankful that the Bible is clear on how we do it. Because here's the thing, we can't just force everybody to put on a get along shirt. I don't know if you know what a get along shirt is, but that's a get along shirt. And so um, and maybe some of you, um, maybe we need to get you together and put you in a get along shirt and that you guys need to figure, and we, you guys can have an intense conversation. Any parents ever done the get along shirt? I've done the get along room with our kids. Like, hey, you guys need to go figure this thing out. Uh, we, of course, stay close in case things start flying around the room. But the get along shirt is only good so far. But Jesus invites us into considering um, how we should resolve this. And in Matthew's gospel, he lays out a real clear plan for us. In Matthew 18, he says, if, one, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out this offense. If the other listens and confesses, you have won that person back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If someone sins against you, go privately and point it out. You might have, you might in the last season have been the victim of someone's anger. You might have been someone took it out on you online. And admittedly, you might have taken it out on someone. You might have gotten a conversation that got heated. You might have gotten a conversation that turned into something else. Because here's the thing. Conversation and a debate are very different, right? If I'm having a debate, you go to a debate and someone wins a debate. The debate team goes and debates and somebody wins the debate. I'm not sure if any conversation with my spouse or with a friend or with my kid is better if I win the conversation. Because that means someone lost the conversation. That if we're talking about something that's important to us, what does it mean for me to say, I wanna win this conversation? Because if I'm a winner, that means you're a loser. Actually, that's not how conversations work. And we're gonna talk in a few minutes with Susie about how do we have healthy conversations. But actually what we've done is we've often debated. I want to go in and I want to win. I want to have a conversation and I want to win. I want to be the victor in this dialogue. And actually, Jesus' motivation here is, yeah, that you would win them back to relationship with you. Not that you would win necessarily the argument. We're supposed to win people to Jesus. We're not supposed to win debates with people. We're supposed to win them to the kingdom through our actions, through our life and the way that we are. It's not a matter of just destroying them in a debate. That's, that's not kingdom work that we're doing. But here's where it gets important. And Susie's going to come up here in just a minute or two. Is this, it says in verse two, because you are in the Lord, settle your disagreement. Because you are in the Lord, settle your disagreement. Here's the, here's the framework and the foundation for this to be on. Is that what Paul is saying is that you are people who love Jesus. You are people that are doing kingdom work. You are people that are building the church together. Your foundation is that you are in the Lord together. Everything you are debating, even if it's doctrine, even if it's theological, or if it's masks, or if it's anything else, is secondary to the fact that you are in the Lord. 
The number one thing is that you are in the Lord. You are, you are fellow believers. You are brothers and sisters in Christ. In this case, you are sisters in Christ. You need to figure this out. This thing that you're debating is not foundational. It's secondary at best. And he's saying, because you are in the Lord, I encourage you to settle your dispute. And what does it mean for us to do that? Paul's pleading with them. Your sisters in Christ, you got to figure this out. He's pleading to us, your brothers and sisters in Christ. How can you let this divide you? How can you let this issue divide you? How can that be the thing that has become everything that you're about? It's about Jesus. It's about, it's about him. It's about the ministry. And he is saying to these women, like you've been a part of it. And the people that are with you, man, these are people that are written in the book of life. He says, these are people that are doing incredible kingdom work. And you're two of them. Let's focus on building the kingdom. Why are we spending our time with this, di- this, this dispute that you find yourself in? But we go back to the book of Philippians as uh, Susie, I'm going to invite you up and we'll, we'll go here. Um, Philippians 1, 2, 3 says, what happens when you, um, that we would conduct, Philippians 1, 27 says that we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. How many conversations, I mean, debates have you issued that have veered off into something not worthy of the gospel? That we've spoken in words and tones and with languaging and potentially insults. That is not worthy of the gospel. Have you, have, has the way that we've communicated in this season and engaged with conflict been worthy of the gospel? Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value yourself of others above yourself. Where's humility come into this? Phil did a great sermon a couple weeks ago about humility. Where's humility entered a conversation as we discuss things that are important to us and issues that are important to us? He encourages Yodia and Syntyche to find a resolution to their problem. And Jesus does that and brings simple terms to it. Get together and talk about it. And if you need help, bring someone in to have the conversation with you to mediate so you make sure that you're heard is what he's saying. And so what I wanted to do this morning is Susie is the director of the Peace Portal Counseling Center. She is a tremendous gift to our church. Um, and I wanted her to come and have a conversation with us so that we could talk about Paul's encouragement to us is to navigate and figure out what these conf- how to navigate these conflicts. And so what I want to do is say, Susie, how on earth do we have these conversations? Because there's some wounds that are festering. There are some issues that are unresolved and... There are probably people in this room that may have been in conflict in the last season or are experiencing conflict in their homes, experiencing yeah. conflict um, within friends, neighbors, whatever it happens to be. So, yeah. So I, I, we are sensitive to that fact yeah. of just even starting that there are some broken relationships even within our community. And our hope today is maybe to give some opportunities for reconciliation. You know, when we think about the word conflict, there's a feeling of combativeness, yeah. you know, a feeling of like fight. Yeah. Right. And I wonder sometimes what it would be like for us to think about it as conversations. There's a different feeling when you're thinking about it as a conversation and a conversation where people are seen and heard and understood and agree to disagree. Yeah. And we talked about this is that oftentimes a conversation can get heated and then we decide that instead of we don't call it a conversation anymore, we say it was a fight. Right. 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 It actually is just a conversation where we talked about things we were passionate about. Right. Mm -hmm. but we characterize it as a fight and combative. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we're doing ourselves a disservice by Mm -hmm. characterizing it that Mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, one of the questions I asked you, and I would love for us to grow together as we learn this, Mm -hmm. is how do, why do we avoid critical conversations like resolving conflict? Yeah, probably the most prominent one is fear. We're afraid of disappointing or upsetting someone. We can be afraid of being judged. We can be afraid of the emotions that might happen, maybe the uncontrollable ones of myself or someone else. Um, We can be afraid of not being able to actually have the skills to have the conversation. And I think sometimes it's important for us to reflect on the homes that we grew up in, right? Yeah. And, and what was role modeled for us as our parents. You know, some, some homes, they avoid conflict at all costs. I mean, there's many people I've talked to where it's like, yeah, growing up, there was no conflict. And so there's that, or it was very conflictual and no resolution. And so part of it is observing sort of what's my tendency? Is my tendency to avoid it? Is my tendency to go in at it? Um, So understanding that can be understanding why it might be a barrier, because if you're avoiding it, uh, you might want to find some ways, which I'm hopeful for today, 
Um, and then the other one is that you don't have the skills, and that's a part of today is to provide some uh, ways to engage in courageous conversations with each other. And I guess there's a bit of humility in there too of saying that didn't go well, right. or I, I, my part to play in it is that I actually need to seek resolution. Yes. Or to say, hey, Susie, I, I really feel hurt by our conversation. Mm -hmm. And so to mm -hmm. say, to come like humbly and say, mm -hmm. and do the hard thing of saying that to you yeah. would be a big yeah. part of it. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, what are some barriers, though? Mm -hmm. Like, what are the things that keeps us from having that conversation? We, yeah. You, you kind of spoke a little bit. The one that I've seen, actually, uh, in my own life with parents, of uh, whether it's adolescents, young adults, or adults, I mean, there is this need to be right, you were speaking a bit. So, like, people are going to go in, and they are going to find facts. They are going to... Um, you know, maybe intellectualize it and they're going to keep going. It can get louder or whatever because their perspective is the right perspective to believe. And unfortunately, in those situations, the relationship suffers. Hurt and pain can happen when I'm going in it and I'm right, you're wrong. And there's just a different energy with that, yeah. right? And then what about like one of the barriers too? Like how, how about where we have these conversations? Mm-hmm. How, how aware? Where? where? Where we have them. Yes. Well, uh, yes. And the social media part. But for, for this part, it's like the other part is when we're in sort of a conflict, I'm, one of the barriers is that I'm listening to respond. So when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about the response I'm going to have because either I'm defending my position or now I'd like to fight for you to listen to my position. But in that, we actually aren't heard. We're yeah. not understanding each other because all we're doing is we're trying to listen to respond to what you've just said. Like a debate would happen. Yes. You're saying a yeah. fact and I'm quickly yeah. checking. I yeah. got to make sure that my fact goes yeah. against yours. And so mm -hmm. I'm not even listening to what you're mm -hmm. saying. I'm just ready to say counterpoint. Yes. Right? Yes. Which never goes well. Right. And yeah. there's an expectation sometimes in our relationship that we're going to agree on everything yeah. or we're going to believe the same things. And so even that expectation. And then there's the assumptions, which assumptions, I think, with social media are part of what happens so often. I mean, how many of us have either received a text or sent a text and it's been misunderstood or misinterpreted? You know, I've, if I receive a text from Jeff, I could think he's mad at me right? And part of what you're saying is that when we're not together, and I could see, because if Jeff said the same thing to me in person, I could see his face. And either maybe his eyes might be a bit lighter, or he might be smiling. But when I receive the text right away, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's mad at me. Yeah, you add tone. You add the mm -hmm. tone that you have ascribed or assumed mm -hmm. to that person. Mm -hmm. And it's weird. I don't know. I might be the only one. When I read text messages, I read it in their voice. Right. Right. And so then I'm even more annoyed that it's like yeah, getting the tone yeah. from my mom. And 90% of our communication is, or 80%, is nonverbal. So the biggest part in social media that's missing is this, is being together, is being able to sense where you're at, right? And I, my dad said when we, he always said, if it's an important conversation, pick up the phone. And he said, pick up the phone to call, not to text. We can have wisdom from our elders where they yeah. call the person. And, and actually, the best situation would be if you can come in person with each other and yeah. have a conversation. Yeah, and the nature of a conversation on Facebook, for example, is that I write something, I share an opinion or I share something, and then... Ten minutes, imagine a conversation where I said something, 20 minutes later, you showed up and said something. An hour and a half later, I showed up to the same conversation and said something. And then someone else who wasn't a part of our conversation jumps in and joins our conversation. And they're not even from around, like around here or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's like, we're having this conversation over eight hours yeah. that could have actually been a wonderful conversation that we could have had in five minutes right. up close. Right. And I missed out on that what I said hurt you right? because I didn't get to see your face, your body language, any of those things. And what you said, oh, I didn't, you didn't see disappointment on me or agreement mm -hmm. from me mm -hmm. um, when you said what you said, because we had it in such a way that we could, yeah, be one emboldened behind a keyboard and kind of say things yeah. sometimes that we don't yeah, think Yeah, it's are so mean. much more courage. Like there's so much courage it takes to be in person and have conversation it's a bit less when you actually can just type it and leave it. And then an hour and a half, I'm thinking you're mad at me. Yeah. So I'm just sitting here. And the Matthew worried. 18 stuff is like, you tell yeah. people that and then they're like, Ooh, seriously, that's, I have to go talk to them now. 
Like this person, I have to literally go up to them and see them. And then if that, I need to invite somebody else in. Because what we do instead is we say, I'm going to go talk to my friend Susie and vent to Susie about so-and-so. Or we're Christians. We're like, hey, you got to pray for so-and-so. They're really, really not doing good. And then we, we prayer gossip with people instead of going saying, hey, I'm going to go have a conversation with you. And like, we need to work this out because I love you. You're my brother. You're my sister. And we share way more in common than we don't. And so, and because Jesus invites us into it, that I would go and pursue harmony with you, that we could now continue forward in the mission that God's called us collectively to. Um, how do we have good, healthy conversations? Well, you were just starting it. And, and I think the beginning is uh, to really focus on our connection and our relationship with each other. That's the, that's the beginning part. And so I use the analogy of a rope. So Jeff and I are friends. There's a rope between us. This could be a spouse. This could be a family member. And the rope represents our connection for one another. And the issue is outside. So if we're talking about, yes, we are going to talk about. We're I know talking about something real controversial, well, just so you know. So no, we know that we're sensitive of the men. ready. But the issue is there. And so often what ends up happening is that the issue comes in between our relationship, right? And it actually divides our connection. And so really the very first part of it is seeing that the relationship and the cord is the most important part, that we love each other, that we care about each other, that we're brothers and sisters in Christ, that that's the most important piece. And one way to do that is to listen, to understand each other, to be curious. So often people come in and they're like, you know, I don't feel understood. I don't feel heard. And a part of it in my head is like, what is it that, that, that I don't understand or that I'm not hearing? And when people come into my office, at me is what I want to say, because there's an energy when someone comes at you. And I'm in the office, you know, I'm sitting with my hands here, but actually visually, I'm sitting like this with my arms open, thinking in my head, what is it that this person needs me to understand about them? It's a totally different way of receiving than it is going at it, right? And for me, sometimes just reflecting back what they have said or saying thanks for sharing um, and leaving it for that, I'm a bit different because I need a bit of time to think. So I've learned this through the years. And then the 24-hour rule, just give yourself 24 hours to sort of think about it especially if you're emotional, and then come back to it. So when there are situations, but it is that listening to understand the other person's perspective that can really help our relationship. Yeah, and I think that you mentioned something. You said, hey, it's good for you to have 24 hours. So if I say I need an answer in an hour, yeah. that's not fair to you. So if, if I, you and I are friends and I know, hey, Susie, the best way for us to have a conversation is to sit and have a coffee. Yeah. And then, but you might be like, I hate coffee. Mm -hmm. And then now that's not a great situation. Hey, let's go for a walk. I had a staff member that used to work with. And when we needed to talk about serious stuff, we'd go for a drive and they would sit in the back seat behind me because they didn't like having a face-to-face -face conversation. And we had our Were most meaningful and sometimes <laughs> challenging conversations. Uh, I'm a good driver. Is, uh, while we, I was driving around and yeah. that way they didn't feel yeah. the pressure of being like, feeling like sure. a person's really coming at me, like you said, with that mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful way to talk to teenagers. Anyways, and the other one is like self, this is a bit bigger, but self and emotional awareness. So I'm responsible for the 100% of my 50% of the relationship. Mm -hmm. You're responsible. So if I get emotional, I'm responsible for that, for us to be in relationship with one another. And make your expectations realistic. Like sometimes I think we believe that we should all believe the same thing, right? And then sometimes, you know, in my family, you know, people won't change, right? And so there is this part of us that we need to adapt to the fact that some people won't change and to let it go. And then some people can't have these conversations. It's not safe for you. I wouldn't want to put people in unsafe situations. Mm -hmm. these, these are like healthy situations where you feel like people could engage in it. And you also alluded to this of like aligning ourselves in something, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's aligning ourselves in our relationship, that our relationship matters between the two of us, or aligning ourselves with the fact that we are children of God and we are here trying to be united with one another. And one of the things that you and I talked about before is that understanding doesn't mean agreement. Right. Right? Is that I, you could say, yeah, I don't feel understood. So important. That you could understand my entire so perspective important. and you could reiterate back to me, hey, you think this, 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 and this is why. 
but you understanding me doesn't necessarily mean you have to agree with me. Right. But it's nice to know that you've like done the work to understand my perspective on mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. understand where I've come from and how I've arrived there, as opposed to just dismissing it or whatever, you know? It makes a huge difference. Are you ready to open a can yes. of worms here? All right. Okay, so, so here we are. We're going to we, sort of do the how. I was going to, we're going to model it a little bit, but I thought, what's the most controversial thing I can think of going into the summer? <laughs> and it's simply this. Is it okay for me to water my lawn and keep it green all summer? Okay, right, I wanna know, like this is, this is a hot button issue for me. I'm on team green lawn. I like having a well fertilized green lawn. I like cutting the grass. I like the lines. I like the weed free. I like this. And Susie, as I discovered, her family has recently converted to brown lawn and uh, they have decided that they're gonna to let it go. a little more environmentally yeah, friendly. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yes. sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we're going to, I think this would be a good metaphor for us that if we can talk about something that isn't the hot button issue of the day, but get, talk about it in a way that's practical, that we can one, find our, our connection and our alignment mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. being brothers and sisters in Christ. We can talk about something that is important to me mm-hmm. and maybe form differently important to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so how do we have a conversation about it? Because I think mm-hmm. if anything, like, yeah, go and talk to someone, but how do I have the conversation when I get there? Yes. So, yeah. And so Marshall Rosenberg, he was a beautiful human being who actually mediated lots of high, I wish he was alive today, many conflictual um, situations. And so he actually has a model. He wrote a book called Nonviolent Communication. And when I worked in schools, even it's restorative circles. And the model was this. So that's what we're using. And I did want to caveat by this is, I just wanted to say this needs to be a safe uh, relationship. It's like, I wouldn't say to a child, a teenager, a person in a work environment who was being bullied or in an abusive one, hey, go and be vulnerable and engage in this conversation because it wouldn't go well. And so we're here, we're healthy, we think. We're healthy with a little bit of unhealthiness. But uh, so we're going to engage in this with that perspective. Perspective, okay, so the very first thing that that we do is find the facts like facts that you can't dispute right or noticing and observing and so with this particular situation that we're using the fact is that Jeff's lawn is green and it's lush mm-hmm. my lawn is dry and brown that's the truth. Another fact is Jeff works hours on it in the week hours and fact is maybe one hour a month. Maybe that would be a fact for us. What I observe, and observing without judging, what I observe about Jeff is when he talks about his lawn, his eyes light up. They just light up. When I talk about my lawn, my eyes don't light up. Okay? So those would just be facts, and that's where we start. We start with the facts. His facts, my facts. The next part are feelings. Okay, so in this situation that we're talking about, you know, Jeff uh, Jeff posted something and then I sent an environmentally friendly article just for his FYI. Yeah. In case, so this is social media, just in case he wasn't aware of what was going on, okay? And in this scenario, I overheard Jeff in the courtyard making fun of my lawn and my husband's lawn with a whole bunch of our friends, okay? So that's, that's, where, that's the context of this. So in this context, you are feeling... Yeah, I feel judged that you think that I don't care about the earth and even applying water in a temperate rainforest to grass and within the rules set forth by Metro Vancouver. And I get that Metro Vancouver... Oh, look, he's really going they at do, it. They say, water a little less, care a little more, which <laughs> would mean that those yeah. that water their lawns are per- perhaps so, uncaring. So, Jeff, I feel, Susie, when you send me that article... I feel like you're saying I'm uncaring. Yeah, And you uncaring. feel like I'm a, that I'm... I'm un- I don't care about the environment yeah. when in fact I feel like yeah. I'm creating yeah. a beauty. I'm creating beauty. Yeah. Maybe a little hurt that I think that. Yeah. You're- yeah. yeah. And then I was like really embarrassed. So I feel embarrassed when you talk and make jokes about my lawn. Yeah. Okay. It's so- crispy. So I sometimes, yeah. <laughs> you know, you gotta. So, so you get the picture. It's I feel when that's sort of the feeling part. 
okay? The needs is the meat of this model. If you can access the needs, and Marshall Rosenberg actually has two pages of basic human needs, and so it could be quite a few. To be honest, in the, in the context globally, you know, a need could be safety, a need could be freedom, so there's quite a few pieces there, but for our purposes, I mean, Jeff's basic need is caring. That's it. And actually, he's going to get really the needs because the needs are so, and mine is for the environment, the care for the, like air, food, water, that's mine. And so we will get, because if we understand our needs and what's underneath it, that's what fuels the feelings. That's what fuels our energy to actually become combative. Mm -hmm. And so if we're able to access those, we're able to understand what's going on for both of us, right? So when we talk about that listening to understand, that's what you're listening to understand, is what are those needs underneath what's going on for you? Yeah. Yeah. And, and we often assume, and often maybe assume a simplistic version of the other's motives. Right. Right? Is that I have a deep conviction about having, being hospitable with my home mm -hmm. and having a green lawn and taking care of something and watching it grow. And you might look at me and think, oh, it's just vain and a waste of water. And I might think, well, you're, you don't water your lawn, you don't cut it because it's more time you could do something else. And you're, I might think you, I, I might characterize you as lazy, which you're obviously not. Um, and so I could have a simplistic view of your mm -hmm. view. Obviously mine is a robust, complex, well thought out, <laughs> theologically accurate view of why I should water the lawn. And you just need to hear me give you all my facts. And then of course you'll be one to my side and we'll enjoy a lush green lawn together, um, <laughs> et cetera. But it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> See, so this is how it goes, right? I'm not passionate about this, this is, at all. This is, <laughs> this is why we chose this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so you get it. And we can make assumptions about each other if we don't actually understand those underneath underneath needs, okay? And then the last part about it is request. So when we're able to do the facts, the feelings, the needs, then we're able to make the request. And so I think, Jeff, your request for me would be maybe not to post yeah. environment like your passive, in your face kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, your passive aggressive posts yes. about yeah. being careless and the beauty of a brown lawn. Yeah. I get it. I get it. I know. <laughs> uh, but I sometimes feel like instead of talking to me, you just kind of post the stuff. Right. To right. stir controversy. Okay. And then my request would be like, please don't make jokes about my lawn. Absolutely. Yeah. That I would appreciate if you didn't do that. Yeah, I won't. I'll never do it again. So we joke, but at yeah. the end of the day, I hope you understand that that is a model for those of you who are in situations that can be restorative, you know, that can help resolve these situations. And if we then go down deeper into our alignment with each other and the unity that you and I share, for you were just saying it, in Christ, mm -hmm. if we can hold ourselves in that alignment, that can help us in our conversations. Yeah, it kind of allows us to kind of sift through these issues and get down to that foundation mm -hmm. that is our relationship in mm -hmm. Jesus. And I know it's a silly example, a lawn or whatever, but it's like, it's something we could have opposing opinions on, yeah. that we're allowed to have opposing opinions on, that we can talk to about objectively. Yes. I can care deeply about it, and you can yes, care you deeply do. about it on both sides. I do mm -hmm. care about it deeply. Um, but I, uh, I think these are the tools that we can offer ourselves and one another to say how we talked about that. You can talk about basically anything at this point. And sometimes it can be really hard and you may need some help with this, right? Whether it is a counselor or someone else, there's no shame in that. You know, if we want to resolve a broken relationship, you know, there is help to help us walk through it, especially now in this season. I do think it's like the most incredible time for us to be having this conversation to sort of engage in restoration. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna invite the band up. Susie, I wanna pray for us because I think for some, I know for myself, I feel like there's conversations that I need to go have, right? Right. And I'm even in right. like, there's a couple ongoing things right. that I feel like that I've, I've got a heavy suitcase full of stuff that... We got some, I have work to do in my own life with people and I, I don't want to carry that with me. So let me pray. God, thanks so much for today and thanks for Susie and her wisdom and God, these tools that are given us to help us live out the principles outlined um, through Paul's challenge uh, to the church of Philippi in, Ma um, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus' words asking us to have these conversations. But God, they can be intimidating. They require bravery. They require boldness. So God, give us uh, the boldness to have these conversations. Um, with the belief and the understanding that we are pursuing harmony, that we are pursuing getting back to pulling in the same direction. 
God, forgive us where we've overstepped. Forgive us where we've been unkind. And God, would we in humility approach those that we might have harmed or approach those that have harmed us and say, hey, we need to talk. And can we get together and do that? And God, would you be there in the midst of those conversations? For the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the work that you're doing, God, would we be a united people? Pray this all in your name. Amen. We'd love for us to stand one more time. We're going to respond in song together. Sing together. We are your people.
The nature of the ministry of Jesus was that of reconciliation, reconciling all people back to God. And in a small way, we can participate in that reconciliation by being a people that celebrate and value reconciling one another, reconciling ourselves to one another, that we would show up in humility where we've been wrong, where we would have conversations and not debates. And we would be a people shoulder to shoulder, engaging our community with the truth of Jesus Christ, but doing so united, keeping short accounts and not carrying around a suitcase full of unresolved conflict and bitterness and pursuing Jesus with our lives and modeling how to do that well for people. God, thanks so much for this morning. Thanks so we could be together. And um, thanks for this church that's joining us online, for all the folks that are there. Thanks for everyone that's here in this room. God, what a gift uh, you are to us. Your grace abounds. God, would you show us where we um, need to pursue reconciliation, God? And uh, where those are, where people are bold enough and brave enough to approach us, God, would we engage in that process in humility, with curiosity, um, with a desire to be united, to be peacemakers. Pray this all in your name. Amen.